Hey guys. My name's Jeremy. Uh, you guys, Aaron, thank you. Appreciate that, man. Hey guys, I, I'm a random guy. You guys probably don't know me. I wish I could have gotten to know you more. I work here on property. I do soundboard stuff, what Haley's doing back there. Um, I'm her boss. So, guys, excited to get in the Bible with you. If you guys want to turn to, you ready for this? Psalm 39. Psalm 39. We're going to go through seven quick verses. Seven quick verses, Psalm 39. Here's what I did. I prayed and I asked God, Lord, what do you want to share with these kids? I don't really know. And I felt like the Lord put this one word on my heart, and the word was hope. These kids need hope. Um, and you guys have heard that word before. It's one of those Christian words, hope, salvation, love, joy. And you know the thing about those words is that the more you hear them, sometimes this thing can happen. It can become numb, right? It sort of gets factored in with like the Christianese words. Oh yeah, there's hope in Jesus. You know, or yeah, God loves you. And isn't that sad that those things are monumental things? The fact that there even is a God and the fact that he would want anything to do with us at all. And what I don't want to happen is I don't want these monumental things like the fact that there's hope and love. I want those to become meaningless. You know, they say, what do they say? They say that the more words you use, you know, words are like currency. The more you use them, the less they're worth. And so what I want to do is I want to just focus on this psalm. We'll read it. We'll pray. We'll go through it. And then we'll get out of here. But super excited. And I, I know a lot of people say that around here. I really am. I really am super excited to share with you guys because you guys are awesome. I don't even know you, but I know you're awesome. The fact that you'd willing, be willing to spend your summer coming here. And maybe some of you guys just, your parents wanted you to come here. And you don't really know what's going on. You're sort of just here, but hey, good job, guys, getting through this program, and I'm excited to see what God's going to do in your lives. So I'll stop yammering. Let's read the Bible. Psalm 39 says this, starting in verse 1, David writing, I said, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle so long as the wicked are in my presence. I was mute and silent. I held my peace to no avail, and my distress grew worse. My heart became hot within me. As I mused, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue, O oh Lord, make me know my end, and what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. Behold, you have made my days a few handbreadths, and my lifetime is as nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath, Selah. Surely a man goes about as a shadow. Surely for nothing they are in turmoil. Man heaps up wealth and does not know who will gather. And now, O oh Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. Okay, let's pray. God, we thank you for this time. We thank you that you're real. We thank you that your word is true. And we just want to ask, Lord, number one, we want to ask you to wake us up. Help us to hear what you have to say. Lord, I believe you have specific words for specific people in this room. And so, Lord, we just need you to, to do a work. We're asking that. Would you do a work? Um, Lord, we get distracted easily. I know I do. And so I just need you to... Um, focus my mind. Focus our minds, Lord. We love you, Lord. We're blessed by you. We thank you so much for Jesus Christ, Lord. Thank you for what he's done for us. So we're asking, wake us up. Bring blessing on this time, Lord. Fill this place with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, okay. Uh, Psalm 39, first three verses. You guys probably saw it. Lots of distress. If you look through those verses, you flip through them real quick. Lots of distress. Has anybody ever been distressed in here? Okay. King David can relate to you. He was distressed. Verse 2, we see it there. Um, and King David's distressed for a certain reason, because there's certain people in his life. 
Has anybody ever annoyed you guys or weirded you out or distressed? Okay. Especially at the end of camp, you guys are like, amen, you know, the people in my room. I know. I know. I, I was here too. Not in this program, but at Bible college. And, you know, I, I know what it's like to be raising your hands in worship one second, and then an hour later, you know, your roommate's cussing you out or, you know, weirding you out. Oh, yeah, Jesus, we love you so much. Could you get your stuff off my bed? You know, I understand how that goes. You know, it's the balance. And so, well, David was a distressed guy, and he was distressed by people. He was distressed by wicked men. You know, and David's reaction in verse 1 is to do this thing. He wants to guard his way. You know, think, put up your guard. You want to guard your way. He wants to guard his ways. And the question we need to ask is why? Why does David want to guard his ways? And we see it in the next line of verse 1, if you want to look at it. He says, lest I what? Lest I sin. Lest I sin with my tongue. And so David wanted to guard his ways because he knew that though he was a believer, though he was a Christian, there was still this possibility for this thing called sin to take place in his life. And so this is what he did about it. He wanted to guard himself from that, wanted to guard myself from sin. And so notice David, used, David uses his mouth and he says this thing verbally. He says, I will guard my ways. I will restrain my mouth with a muzzle. And so the commitment, he's, he's saying this commitment to God. And many of us, we probably said commitment, made commitments with our mouth with God. Lord, I'm going to get up every morning and do devotions. And God, I just want to be a man of God or a woman of God. And you guys know that it's one thing to say things to God and to make promises to him, and it's quite another to fulfill it in your life. You guys know people like that, that they say really spiritual sounding things, but then you look at their life and you're like, wow, I don't know if those two things go together. I think that's what's wrong with Christianity today. We have a lot of people saying spiritual things, but they're not living spiritually. You know, we get those people around here every now and then at Bible college that, you know, they're always, they always have their nose in their Bible, but then they are big jerks you know, to people. And those two things don't add up because if we're really reading this thing called the Bible, then we should have the love of Christ for other people and we should have joy, you know, not like we always feel joyful, but we're reminded of why we have joy. And so, you know, a commitment's been made with David's mouth. He's going to do this thing. And verse two, we see that he actually follows through with it. Check out verse two. Look what it says. It says, I was mute with silence. I held my peace even from good and my sorrow was stirred up. And so David, he successfully keeps his lips from sin, but then he also keeps his lips from good. You know, sometimes things can frustrate you in life and you could almost, uh, you can combat it with one way, but then you end up throwing the baby out with the bathwater and you end up screwing up in another area. You know, like I'm overweight, so I'm gonna work out, but then you work yourself into the ground and that becomes your God. Instead of food, it becomes working out. And so. There's a dynamic going on here, you know, and David's learning that. And so notice in verse 2, he successfully shuts his mouth from sin. But then we see even though he stops the inflow of words or the outflow of words coming out of his mouth, this thing's going on inside of him. It says sorrow is stirred up. And to wake some of you guys up, I'm just going to get the picture of like a witch with a big, you know, cauldron and she's stirring up a witch's brew. I'm just, I'm, the only reason I'm saying this is to wake you up. All right. So the sorrow inside of him is being stirred up. And what does that mean? What does it mean to stir up sorrow? You know, another way of thinking of that phrase stirred up is fanning a flame. You guys ever seen Survivor before? You know, they're trying to get a flame going. So what does it start with a spark? If it catches, what do they do? They what? They blow on it, right? So they're trying to fan that flame. Why? Because when they fan that flame, it's going to become a fire. It's going to get huge. And so when he's talking about the sorrow being stirred up inside of him, what he's talking about is, I kept my lips shut, but then this thing happened. There was a monster growing inside of me, and it was a monster called sorrow. There was a monster called sorrow. And though David... He wasn't drifting from God with his words. That didn't mean that he was drifting. He wasn't drifting from God in his heart. You know, and isn't it crazy how you can, you can look like you have it all together on the outside? You could be saying the right words. You could be lifting your hands in worship. You know, you could look like the token spiritual person with the Christian bumper stickers on your car. And then on the inside, you could be rotting away. You could be rotting away. 
you know, I get this picture. There's this movie called Gravity. And do you guys remember that scene where, if for, some, for those of you that, that saw it, she's in outer space, right? And there's all these, these collisions happening with these rocks. You know, there's, these, I don't know the proper term, you know, what, asteroid or some type of flying rocks, meteorites, I, I don't know. But they're happening, and it's crazy because there's all this destruction, this ship's being torn apart. And because they're in space, there's no sound. And so you have this destruction, massive destruction to the ship, to other rocks, and there's no sound. And I think that's a good picture of how we can be sometimes. There's so much going on in our lives, and we're so afraid to say anything. We just think the spiritual thing to do is to shut our mouth so that no one knows we have issues. And all the while, there's all of this destruction going on inside of us. Sorrow is building up. Sorrow is building up, you know, and so, um, you know, maybe we don't feel like a spiritual person and we see all these people around here saying these token spiritual things. And the thought can be, man, I'm not as spiritual as these people. And it's just not true. You know, the truth is that we're all in need of a savior. And a lot of times people could say spiritual things because everybody else is saying it. You know, and what we can do is we can shut up, we could clam up, we could not say anything, we could just be like, these people really weird me out, but I'm sort of just gonna put up with it because they know something I don't. You know, we don't feel good enough to say anything and so we don't and because of that, there's this sorrow inside of our hearts and David gives us some more details about what's going on inside of him. Look at verse three, he says, my heart was hot within me while it was musing, the fire burned. And so notice that David, he might look peaceful on the outside, he kept silent, but on the inside, things are heavy. They're like 100 pounds inside of him. And the core of his being, the thing that pumps blood through his veins, his heart, it's on fire. It's on fire. And so David, notice it says, while I was musing, the fire burned. And so David is musing, meaning he's thinking about things. He's using his brain. It's good to use your brain. But I tell you what, sometimes it's bad. Sometimes it's bad to use your brain, you know. And I think that um, it's important to see that as he mused, or as he thought, it only made the fire burn more. And you might be wondering, well, why is it bad to use your brain? It's bad to use your brain when you overthink things. You guys ever done that before? You overthink things. You know, you try to figure stuff out. How about this? You try to figure out your plans. Lord, I think you're doing this, but I don't really know. You can stay up late in your bed at night worrying about things, overthinking things. And all that does is it's fueling this fire. So um, that never helps. It just makes you go nuts, you know. Sometimes you could be frustrated with injustice in life. I, we read about how God's a God of love and justice, but then we live on this fallen planet where people are unjust or unjust, you know, and that could be frustrating. We could overthink things. Lord, why would you put me in this family? Why would you have me be in this place? Why can't I live at, in Marietta at this Bible college? Why do I got to go back home with this abusive person? Why do I have to be around these friends that annoy the heck out of me? Why did you make me the way I am? You know, why do I have, why do I have these desires to do these things that are bad? It's just inside of me, you know? And we can overthink things. And David, he's musing, he's thinking about life, but it's not helping. It's not doing anything good. It's not producing love and joy inside of him. You know, and so in the heat, in the sorrow, in the thinking, David does this thing. He opens up his mouth. Go ahead, everybody, let's open up our mouths. Okay, nobody opened up their mouth. I just look like an idiot up here doing this. Come on, guys, one, two, three. All right, he opened up his mouth. That's right, that was good. That was a good one. And here's what happened. Words came out of his mouth, right? That's usually what happens when you open up your mouth, unless you're yawning. You know, words come out of his mouth, and look at what he says, verse four. Look at the first word, Lord, Lord. And so he says, make me to know my end and what is the measure of my days that I might know how frail I am. So in the middle of David's concern with sin, in the middle of David's sorrow, in the middle of David's heavy, hot heart, David stops and he talks to God. 
He stops and he talks to God. And some of you guys might be thinking, Jeremy, this isn't very profound. We know we could do that. But I mean, I just need to ask you, why does David do this? Why does he open up his mouth to talk to God? And you know, this isn't very profound, but the main reason why I think he does it is because, number one, because he can. Because he can. Because he can open up his mouth and talk to God. Did you know that you could talk to, to God and he'll hear you? You could talk to God and he'll hear you. Did you know that your salvation and your relationship with God aren't based on this place? You could be wherever. God owns the whole earth. He created it all. He created it all. You know, the Lord is the Lord of the, the whole earth. You know, and so why does David notice he, he asked this thing? You know, uh, make me to know my end. And what is the measure of my days? What in the world does that mean? In other words, God, remind me of, you guys ready for this? Remind me of the bigger picture. Remind me of the bigger picture. I'm going to die someday. And the sorrow that I'm going through right now or the relationship that's broken right now or the thing that's on the forefront of my mind, it takes up all my time, is small in comparison to how big life is. Remind me, you know, the sorrow that you feel right now, it doesn't compare with the eternal glory that we have in God. Lord, make me to know my end. You know, I'm not going to live forever on this wicked planet. Did you guys know that yet? Did you guys find out that earth isn't heaven yet? I'm sure a lot of you guys found out inside your dorm room. This place isn't heaven on earth. Praise God. You know, um, and that's important to know because... These days are going to come to an end. For those who are Christians, there's a coming day. Get this. I know you know this. I'm just going to remind you. I know you. I'm telling you a bunch of stuff you've already heard. But there is a coming day when every tear is going to be wiped away from your eye by God. Every tear is going to be wiped away from your eye. And the injustice and the racism and the wrong that annoys us on this earth, it's going to be gone. And so here's my reminder, don't forget that. Number one, remember this place isn't heaven. Sometimes we get frustrated because we're like, man, why aren't these Christians perfect like me? Why are these people so annoying? Don't they know that they should be more like me? You know, we can be so frustrated with people, and we even get frustrated with ourselves. But just know, be reminded, I'm here to tell you today, there's coming a day when that's all gonna change. And that is a fact. You could bank on that. You could put all your treasure on that. You know, and so notice, I want you to notice why David asked this. He says at the end of verse four, look, go ahead and look at it. It says this, that I might know how, what is it, what does your translation say? Frail, that I might know how frail I am. And if you guys want to know what a godly man or godly woman looks like, it's not someone who says a bunch of spiritual things, but it's someone who recognizes how weak they are. Um, I was talking to this missionary that our church sent out. Um, you know, stumbled in some stuff he shouldn't have. Um, and in tears, he told me, I just wanted to look strong. He kept all the stuff hidden in secret because he just wanted to look strong. He wanted to look like a spiritual man. And I had to remind him, we're weak. <laughs> we're weak. It's just the truth. We're weak people. And that's what we do. That's what we need to get good at. We need to lift our weakness high. I'm weak. I don't have it all together. I'm not strong. I'm me. And God knows that. When God sees that, this thing happens. He says, I could use that person. I could use someone who is weak because I could be their strength. But I tell you what, God does this thing to those people that don't admit that. He resists them because God resists the proud. But to the humble, the people that are willing to say, I don't have it together. I have issues. I'm weak. I have problems that would disturb you if I told you. God says to that person, I'll give you grace because you're willing to humble yourself. But to the people that have it all together, they're like, no, I'm good, God, to those people he resists. And he says, okay, I can't use you. Have you guys ever tried to teach someone that knows every, everything something? Can't really teach them anything, can you? They already know it all. 
That's called pride. This guy's up here at the pulpit trying to teach me stuff. He doesn't even know I grew up in a pastor's home. Oh, sorry. You, can, you could just skip on to the upgraded class. I guess this, you already know this stuff. But the more I live, guys, the more I'm realizing I don't know anything. <laughs> Anytime I think I know a bunch, the Lord just puts one person into my life that drives me crazy. I'm just like, man, I'm not as loving as I thought I was. I'm really a big jerk. I'm not as spiritual as I thought I was. I know all these scriptures. I could quote them to you like the back of my hand, but I am a sinner and I am weak. And that's who God's looking to use. You know, we want to be people like David who recognize, we say, God, help me see the bigger picture because I need to be reminded of how weak I am, how frail I am. You know, when you look at eternity and how big it is, I mean, I, I, our mind... If you're like me, you're thinking, well, what does that even look like? How do you measure that? You can't. Because we're small. We have these finite minds. We're trying to figure out God. We're trying to figure out time. We're trying to figure out eternity. And we're, we're not, my, my daughter always asks me, how can God do this? And, and how, who created God? And I said, Tatum, you got to understand, God's not a human. He's not a human. He never will be. The Son of God came and put flesh on but you're asking a finite question to an infinite God. It's not going to work out. But, but how does God sleep? God's not a human. You know, he never, he's never going to have the limitations that we have. And so our, we're going to rack our minds trying to think about that. And so I want to be like David here, recognizing I'm weak, recognizing I need to be shown that I'm frail. Listen, I'm not going to watch that rated R movie with you, not because I'm so spiritual, because I know I'm not spiritual. How about that? I'm not going to go drinking with you. I'm not going to go do this stuff, not because I'm better than you, but because I'm worse than you. I'm worse than you. That's why I shouldn't do this stuff. Not because I think I'm some per person that's high and lifted up and better than things. I'm worse than you. That's why I'm going to stay away from this stuff, because I know myself, and I know I'm weak. I know I need the Lord's strength. And so do we know how frail we are this morning? I don't want to be fooled into thinking I'm good. I want to be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that's only going to happen when I realize what a crummy human I am. Amen? It's only going to happen when I realize how crummy I am. You know, and David needed to be reminded that he's weak. And I'm encouraged by that because this is David the giant killer. This is David the giant killer. This is the guy who killed a lion and a bear. I mean, that's crazy. And he is saying, Lord, I need to be reminded of how weak I am. Look at verse 5. He says this, he continues on this theme of God being big, mankind being small. He says, you have made my days as hand breaths. Think of like measurements. And my age is as nothing before you. Certainly every man at his best state is but a vapor, you know, or but like a breath, you know. When we're on this earth, there are times when we feel like the moments we're in are everything, this moment is everything, or this relationship was everything. I remember this guy, Brett, from my high school, this really sweet kid. He was a freshman in high school. Um, I was my senior year. He's a really nice guy. I always said, hey, Jeremy, how's it going? And this guy, you know, he wasn't the best looking guy. Um, and he ended up getting a girlfriend. And this girl was a cute girl. And you could just tell it just it made him happy just brought him so much joy to be in this relationship. I went off to Bible college later. This kid became a sophomore. I ended up finding out this kid committed suicide. And I guess it was because this girl broke up with him. And these things are so monumental. And you know, speakers can come up here and say like, yeah, you know, it's not about relationships. It's not, but that's hard when you're the kid and you're excited about it. And you're going through these things and, and the dopamine in your brain is being released. And it's exciting. Relationships are exciting. But the thing is, is that we put so much hope into things that aren't God. And we're so bummed when these variables that can change don't work out. And it's so sad, you know. Um, you know, we could be so zoomed in on these things. They're everything to us. They're the world to us. And, and, and we can miss the thing that really matters. And I think a lot of times we miss it because we feel like it, it's not going to affect us. The stuff this guy's talking about up here at this pulpit, it's not going to affect me, you know? And 
we forget to factor in God. We forget to factor in God. And here David chooses to turn his mind from the drama going on in his life, wicked men, even sin, sorrow. He makes a choice. I have sorrow in my heart. He makes a choice, and he decides to think about things from God's perspective. If God created me, then he sees things different than me. And he's starting to see it from God's angle. He chooses, he chooses, he chooses to think about God. And anytime we choose to see things from God's perspective, this thing happens. What ends up happening is we get a proper look at how life really is. How many of you guys want a proper look at life? I mean, I don't, I don't like being fooled. I don't like having the rug pulled out from under me. I hate being surprised by things. I think a lot of people are going to be surprised at the judgment when people are standing before God. We know that there's people that are surprised because Jesus said there would be. Lord, didn't we do this in your name? And people are going to be surprised. And so um, I don't want to be surprised by things. You know, I want to have a proper look at how life really is. And that happens when we choose to see things from how God sees things. And we value what he says. Well, God, what do you think about things? Because here's what I think, but my, I don't trust myself. What do you think? You know, and so all of a sudden, the things that we fear, if you guys have any fears in here, any worries, um, the things that we fear, the things that hold us back, the things that we're insecure about, all the thing, all of a sudden, these things are, are seen for what they really are. It's like the, the cloak is pulled back, and you get to see things how they really are. And so David factors in God and this thing happens, God ends up getting bigger, and David and his problems end up getting smaller. God ends up getting bigger, and David and his problems end up getting smaller. I remember playing football sophomore year of high school. I was so scared. I sucked. I was really bad at football. And it, our coach was a jerk. He would always like cuss at us you know, and yell at us. And I remember just being so scared. And I remember I was so scared that I used to put this Disney Channel show called Lizzie McGuire on. Like, if I could just escape into this world that's totally cheesy and unreal, maybe that will help with the problems that I have. A lot of times we could do that with music, too, or movies, or, you know, an online world. If I could just escape into these worlds, then maybe my problems will be eliminated. And then, but then I'd go back to football, and life's still life, you know, and people are still people. And we're spending so much time trying to escape. And yet, when we have a proper perspective of God, we don't need to go anywhere. You know, we don't need to go anywhere. And so, for many people, this life that we're living right now on earth is everything. It's everything. And yet, life is simply a measurement when it stands by God. Hand breaths. You know, David's age, a lot of people put a lot of pride in age. I'm 21 now, or hey, I'm, I'm 30, I can rent a car, or hey, uh, I know that isn't the age, but hey, I, I'm this age, I'm 60, I know a whole lot. A lot of people could put a lot of stock in an age. You know, so-and-so's dating this person, he's, a, he's 20, you know. But yet, when you put age besides God, it's nothing. And that's what David's saying right here. Any millionaire or any king any leader in parliament, you know, when it's seen through God's point of view, it's vapor. Man at his best is vapor. You know, a breath of air. Think about that. Think of being out in the cold. You could see your breath. How long do you see your breath for? You know, that one breath when you blow out. It, it's there and then it's gone. And so we're thinking about things from God's point of view. And so everything, here's the point, everything changes you guys ready for this? This is sort of, sort of the point. Everything changes when we factor in God. Everything changes. And the question we need to ask ourselves is, do we? Do we factor in God? Do we factor in God? Because if we don't, then we're going to end up looking like these goobers in verse 6. Look at verse 6. It says, Surely every man walks about like a shadow. Surely they busy themselves in vain. They heap up riches, and they don't even know who's going to get it in the end. Think about that. Think about people that work so hard. They work their whole life to be rich. You know, and that's a noble thing. It can be. You know, let's say they wanted to lay, I want to lay up some money for my kids. But let's follow that trail. 
Let's say we die, we can't take our money with us, and then our kids get our money. And let's say our kids spend that money. Who's getting that money in the end? We have no clue. Some sales clerk at Vans, some carnival guy. This money that someone spends their whole life working for. Maybe they have a whole barn full of money. I'm gonna lay this up. They can't take it with them when they die. And whoever they give it to is gonna give it to other people. And so we don't really know the money, what's, what this verse six is saying at the end, we don't even know who's gonna get it in the end. It's gonna go through tons of people's hands. And we're, the problem with that is that we're spending our whole lives to build it up. It's gonna go right through our fingertips. It's gonna go right through our fingers, you know. Um, and so mankind walks about like a shadow. You guys know a shadow, what does a shadow tell us? It tells us, what, the shape of somebody? It shows us there's something connected to that. You know, um, it's the form of a person. But at the same time, a shadow is not a person. It's not. It's simply something that's connected to the real thing. And on earth, we see monuments to George Washington. We see monuments to Abraham Lincoln. We see music recorded by Jimi Hendrix. We have movies recorded by Paul Walker. But at the end of the day, when you're watching Fast and the Furious, are you trying to have a, a full-on verbal conversation with Paul Walker when he comes on the screen? Hey, Paul, how's it going? Hey, hey uh, I liked you in that one movie. Uh, Paul's just going to keep on acting because it's a movie. It's not really him. It's just an image of him. And so, so too, shadows, when it calls us like, we're like shadows. Listen, we're here one day and we're gone. There's a representation maybe that someone was here. Maybe someone sees a photograph you took. But in the end, we're going to die. We're going to die. You know, and so every man walks about like a shadow. We're here right now, but we don't stay here. And you guys, I don't know, you guys can confirm this. There's this new statistic out. Have you guys heard this? It says that 10 out of 10 people are going to die. <laughs> I know. I was as shocked as you are. I was as shocked as you are. But if that's true, if that's true, if that statistic's true, if we could get someone to back that up in here, if that's true, then maybe we should stop living our life on this earth like we're not going to. Maybe we should stop living a life on this earth like we're not going to die. Because the truth is, the train's coming. Everybody's coming and everybody's going. And we put so much stock in things and, you know, and the truth is, is like, maybe I should focus on the things that matter, the things that are going to stay forever. The word of God, heaven, the things that God's concerned about, helping to think the people that God wants me to help on this earth. David says this, surely they busy themselves in vain. Men without God, they busy themselves in vain. The goal of life isn't to make a name for ourselves or to get great things because we're going to die and this earth is going to burn. You know, and so I hate to crush any dreams in here, but that's what the scripture tells us. David then says, obviously, the richest thing. I already sort of talked about that. And so this place David is going to in this verse, this whole section it's leading him away from meaningless existence. You know, it's not about riches. It's not about accomplishments. I hate to sound like the old guy on the lawn yelling at kids, because I'm sure you've heard this message before. I'm just going to be one reminder here. It's not about being really smart. It's not about being really good at things. You know, these things aren't evil in and of themselves, but they're certainly not a cure for sorrow. And I'm here to tell you guys that today. Things aren't a cure for sorrow. But I tell you what, they certainly do Band-Aid it for a while, don't they? They could put a little Band-Aid on. Can you imagine someone that needs open heart surgery and the doctor goes in and just puts a Band-Aid on like the problem? I just ended up with a Band-Aid inside of me, but it didn't fix my heart. <laughs> it didn't, there's just a Band-Aid. And that's, I think, what things do. We have sorrow inside of us and, and, and you could think that a Christian camp is going to fix the problem. I, I knew parents that did that. I went to a private school in junior high, and there were lots of kids there that were horrible kids because they had parents that thought, if I could just, I just need to fix my kids, I'll send them to this Christian school, you know, and that will fix the problem. You know, and the kids go there, they don't really care, you know, they're just, yeah, I'm just doing this because my parents want me to, uh, you know, I'll live it up while I'm here, you know. 
But that doesn't fix the problem. Like a Christian camp doesn't fix the problem in our hearts. It doesn't fix the sorrow. You know, a Christian music doesn't fix the sorrow. Christian activities don't fix the sorrow. Um, if we want to find a cure for sorrow today, we have to look at verse 7. We have to. David says this thing. He says, and now, Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. My hope's in a person. David says, what do I wait for? I promise you I'm almost done. What's the theme of this camp? Living now. Okay. If the theme of this camp is living now, then we need to ask ourselves the same question that David asked himself. What am I waiting for? We're living now. We want to live now, right? What am I waiting for? Did you guys know you can live now? And the best part about this is, is that your life in Christ doesn't need to end when you go home. Did you know that you guys could still have a relationship with Jesus wherever you're at? You know, your salvation isn't dependent on a place. Isn't that a good thing? That's a good thing. That's good for us. You know, notice in verse 7 that David's hope wasn't dependent on anything aside from the Lord. My hope is in God. And right now, we all, we all have things we're into. Um, maybe we're good at things. Maybe we'll grow up and become successful. Maybe we won't. Um, maybe some of us will marry, have kids. Some of us won't. Um, lots of things are going to change in life. But I'm here to tell you guys today that God's never going to change. He's never going to change. He's always going to be the same. And so if you put all your stock in that, it's going to greatly affect your life. It's going to greatly affect your life. And so if our hope is in any of the variable, uh, variables that change in our life instead of God, we need to rethink the things that are important to us. Rethink the things that are important to us. We know God loves us. We know he has a plan for us. We know it. What are we waiting for? Why not? Why not start right now? This pastor at this pastor's conference said this thing to me. He said, the things that you're struggling with right now as a young person, they're these seeds. He said, by the time you get to my age, they become big, huge oak trees if you don't give them to God. Why not deal with it right now? Why not humble ourselves right now? Why not? What are we waiting for? Why not let it sink into our hearts? Our hope is your hope in God, is our hope in God. That's the hope that causes us to live now. Amen? All right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray, and here's why. Because I want this to stick not just to your brains, but to your hearts. So I'm going to pray. And then, Aaron, we got some announcements. or we dismiss? Okay, then we'll do announcements. So let's pray. Let's pray that God would stick this, not to your guys' hearts, mine too. I need to remember this too. Lord, I thank you so much that we have hope. Not just that it's in Jesus, but that it's possible. It's possible for us to have hope. There's a place we can go with our sorrow. And Lord, maybe that's why nothing else is working. Because the place is in you. So I pray that this would stick. So encouraged to see what Aaron has done, Lord. And we know Aaron would just say it's you. We know it's what you're doing in these kids' lives. All of the different helpers and workers that have been helping out with On the Edge. Lord, I pray that this would stick to their hearts. That hope is in you and that you love them, would you bring more revelation of how much you love them? Lord, I pray for, for students that are worried or they're fearful about what's going to happen after this. I pray that they would set up, Lord, and they would, they would just do business with you, Lord. That they would do with, maybe take steps of faith to get contact information, to meet with people during when they go home. And Lord, that you would start something beautiful. I have a feeling you're going to do some crazy things, some really good things in people's hearts. 
That's what's on my heart, Lord. I believe you put it there. So I pray that you would establish that hope that's in you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Not in my name, but in Jesus' name. Amen. And guys, thanks for letting me share, guys. <laughs>